So welcome to the Art of Disability Culture, which has uh, 20 artists with disabilities here at the Palo Alto Arts Center. And I firstly want to say a big thank you to all the staff here who have worked very hard to make the show accessible, both here in the gallery and online for the people who are viewing. As the installation process was coming to an end, I began to realize just how timely um, this show might be. Uh, we're all going through so many unfamiliar situations and challenges and feeling very jangled. And some pieces in, in the show were created as a response to some of the events that are going on. Um, so I'm hoping that you will find this a space of reflection and contemplation but also that you will see the beauty and the joy that there is in the disability community too. So in the, in the uh, introductory space to the show, we have the title of the show, The Art of Disability Culture, which is in black sans serif lettering. And then below that, we have three portraits with yellow backgrounds by Bill Bruckner of his friends. Um, but I'm gonna talk about his self-portrait, which um, I'm going to stand next to. So um, I talked to Bill about his portraiture work uh, before choosing which pieces to have in the show. And he told me that he had to make lots of self-portraits before he could become comfortable with himself and that then he would feel um, that he could create a comfortable environment for people to come and sit in his studio because Creating a self-portrait is a very intimate process and you have to stare a lot at each other and do a lot of close looking. And I think that's another theme of the show is that we want people to really take time. Um, there are lots of images of people with disabilities in the show and we did that on purpose because we want to sort of saturate the environment with images of disabled people so that um, it's not seen as strange or unusual. And Bill's portrait is quite a bold but welcoming um, painting. He is bare-chested and you can see that he has a short right arm. He's smiling. He is an older white guy. He's wearing glasses and he's pretty skinny. Um, he's wearing dark blue jeans and uh, he has bare feet too. And the dark bluish sort of background really throws his body into prominence. So as you come into the gallery, it's one of the first things that you see. Um, and some of the portraits that Bill has done are, um, are prominent activists in the disability community. So this portrait on my right is by uh, is of Leroy Moore who is a really well-known activist and kind of superstar of the disability world. He began this project called Crip Hop and he's just about to start a PhD at UCLA and actually this amazing image of him has been used in lots of publications too and so I'll, I'll try and describe it. It has a yellow background um, and the yellow of Leroy's sweater sort of blends into the background. Uh, he, there are green stripes. He's wearing blue jeans. Uh, he's an African-American man with a moustache and a beard. And he's staring straight at us too. So I think you'll find that a lot of the portraits, um, people are staring directly at, at you and inviting you to hold their gaze and to really engage with them. And on this wall opposite um, is work by, uh, by the younger generation. So Bill sort of represents the generation before the ADA came in in 1990, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, Michaela, Michaela Otery's work she represents the younger generation. So we have two of her amazing digital portraits in the show. Um, and on the left here is, um, is a self-portrait. So again, another self-portrait. And she's wearing a crop top that says, the future is accessible. Um, and I think as a younger generation, she is claiming her space um, in the gallery as a right and, and she doesn't have to fight for it 
in the same way that the older generation had to. Uh, but the portrait I really wanted to talk about is, um, is the memorial portrait of Stacey Milburn, who sadly uh, passed away last year. And Stacey was this amazing dynamo in the disability justice and disability rights um, com community. Uh, she was a great youth organizer and is really well known around the world actually as a, an amazing um, uh, creator of disability joy but also um, disability activism and community. And um, the background is all beautiful, colorful flowers. Stacey's wearing a purple and pink striped blouse. She's in her power chair, she has a trach. Um, and she's wearing blue jeans and a, and a great big smile. And she has dark red glasses too. One of the main um, uh, things that the Bay Area is known for are the art projects uh, run for adults with disabilities. So adult artists who have disabilities can continue a studio practice at places like Creativity Explored, Creative Growth, and NIAD. And they were, uh, they, their model has been followed in lots of places around the country. And on the left, we have some beautiful ceramic masks by Cedric Johnson. And on the right, um, a ceramic plate of food, which is amazing and highly colorful and glazed. And they're both artists from Creative Growth in Oakland. Another artist from one of the programs is Camille Holvoy, who is well known for creating colorful Ferris wheels and cakes and really colorful drawings. And here we wanted to include the work that she's done that references the medications that she takes to keep her in a balanced frame of mind. Um, but some of them refer to uh, the purpose of the med medication. So this one here is for focusing on her art. Um, so they're really beautiful and really colorful. And then on the opposite wall is work by um, Jeremy Burleson, who's, who's quite well known for including medical devices and things like syringes in his work. So we have some of his drawings here too. We're really lucky to have three pieces by Catherine Sherwood in the show, and Catherine is a retired professor of art and painting from UC Berkeley, but also a very uh, prominent person in the local disability community. She founded an artist collective with Sonora Taylor called the Yelling Clinic, which explores the intersection of art, disability, and war. Um, and also looks at how art therapy can help with that. And uh, Catherine had a stroke at the age of 44, so she had to relearn how to make her, her artwork. And she switched from her right arm to her left arm to make her work, and also started to include uh, more disability content. So there are two pieces on my right that are, well, they're both from the healers of the yelling clinic. The, the one, there's a big one on the left here which is called uh, Dr. Speech. And um, it's a kind of assemblage with two uh, bare linen canvases that have uh, been attached so that they make a kind of torso of a person. And then coming down, from the middle of the second canvas is a long gray silk skirt with a, a sort of beautiful knotted um, sash that hangs down. The right arm on the figure is uh, bright red and made with really thick um, paint. And uh, there are two seals um, on the torso in the breast area and then a large one um, for the head. And they're Solomon seals and they have uh, healing properties. Um, and then the one on my right is called Neuron Nurse. And that has a square canvas where a head is. It sort of forms a figure as well. And then two square canvases attached together. 
and then a, a striped kind of um, mattress ticking uh, skirt that hangs down with layers of frills. It's sort of layered. Um, the design on the upper canvases follows um, an illustrator's work whose name is Kahal, I think. I can't remember exactly what his name is. Um, but I know that Catherine is really interested in his work, and he wanted to be an artist, but was persuaded to go into medicine by his father. And he actually won the Nobel Prize for his work on medical illustration. So there's a kind of interesting link with the medical profession again, but also with somebody who wanted to be an artist and, and was prevented from doing so by his by circumstances or by his family. Um, but that's, uh, they both link to um, a really big piece on, on the right, which is, I think it's about 85 inches high and 115 inches wide. It's made on um, the backs of linen history of art images that were used to teach history of art at UC Berkeley. So on the reverse of all this, these pieces are well-known paintings. So um, Catherine taped them together with strips of linen to create a new kind of painting surface and a, and a new way of working. So it's a very irregular shape. Um, I mean, the edges are not straight. They're kind of higgledy-piggledy, depending on the size of the, the um, linen. And you can still see lots of pencil marks about which Artwork is on the reverse, and it, the whole of the top part of the canvas is left blank. But the main focus of the painting is a reclining figure that uses um, an Angra painting as its springboard. So there was a very famous Angra painting from 1814 called Grand Odalisque, and this painting is called After Angra. And, uh, Catherine has started to really play around with art historical conventions. So first of all, it's a woman of color that's being represented. And then we notice that she has, um, her right arm is a prosthetic arm and that she's holding the same fan that's in the original painting. But also her, her head and a sort of headdress is made from scans from, or Catherine scans of her brain from the time when she was recovering. So I love the way that this is playing around with lots of conventions because nude, nudes like this were designed for the male gaze, for um, women as women were objects of, um, uh, well, the male gaze, I suppose, is the, is the best way of describing it. But she's sort of playing around with those conventions, but also asking us to think about what is beauty and what is acceptable and who can be desired. Um, but I feel like she's also looking back at us and um, asking us to think about how inclusive as a society we really are and how much are disabled people included in what's going on. Um, the, the original painting by Angra was pretty controversial in its day because it was thought that he had, uh, that you would need extra vertebrae to create this long, languorous pose. Um, and I think somebody's done research and, and discovered that that is actually true, that you would need extra vertebrae. This kind of pose is impossible. And that um, Angra had also shortened the right arm of the person in the original painting. So there are all these lovely plays on um, anatomy and physicality and our kind of embodiment in the world. I'm standing in front of a range of work by Catherine Lechi Chong, who is a blind artist and created these isolation icons at the start of the pandemic. And um, as the work progressed, it became more complicated and more um, intense, but this is one of my favorite pieces on the left here, which is um, a Madonna and Child, and it's called Cobalt Blue Virgin, and it has layer upon layer upon layer of white paint, 
And uh, Catherine lost her sight quite suddenly, so she had to relearn how to make work as an artist. And so uh, I think you'll find them really interesting. The color is a really significant part of them. One of the uh, most exciting pieces in the show is an interactive labyrinth created by blind artist and labyrinth facilitator Maya Scott. And uh, we want people to actually participate and walk the labyrinth. So I'm going to actually show how to begin that. And um, the labyrinth is made up in the shape of an eye. It's a five circuit labyrinth. And each um, piece of the labyrinth line is made up of prints of drawings of Maya's own eye. So we're kind of suggesting that looking and seeing and staring is all part of the show. And you can simply walk and trace or roll if you're in a, a wheelchair. You can roll over the surface and follow the path. And it's meant to be a journey of contemplation and uh, meditation. And we hope that people will use this space as a way of thinking about the events that we've all been through and dealing with the pandemic and the rise of things like long COVID. And we have no idea how that's going to play out. But this, uh, coupled with Catherine Lechi Chong's isolation icons, creates this kind of space of sacred and um, peaceful time for yourself to think about things. And, and then maybe you can leave the art center refreshed and renewed with a different perspective. We do have quite a few uh, blind artists in the show. And that sort of happened organically. But it also is a way of um, signaling to people that um, blind artists can still make visual art. And here we have ceramics by a blind potter called Don Katz, who uh, lost his sight through meningitis and is still, I think, a, an emerging artist. So he's still studying and learning. And um, he's trying out lots of different ways of making ceramics. Um, the plaque in the center is, um, a phrase that he likes to use all the time, which is, tell it to the cows. Um, I think it's a phrase he used in his recovery. Um, but the ceramics program here at Palo Alto is very uh, thriving and vibrant. And I think the ceramics people might find this interesting. We have uh, a range of work by Rachel Ungerer, who makes work about invisible disabilities. And these are narrative paintings often describing situations where she has not been believed as having a disability. And I think it's a common experience for people. Um, she also references uh, a concept called interdependence that the disability community talk about, which means that we um, often have to make ourselves vulnerable to get through a certain situation. So being fed by somebody is a is a situation that's been described to me as a really good example of interdependence because you become much more intimate than you normally would. Um, and so her work is very lush and painterly, but it's full of these deep stories too. And I love this drawing of hers, disabled hands, strong hands um, in charcoal. And opposite Rachel's work is uh, a couple of video pieces by Sky Kubakub and their Rebirth Garments project, which has the principle of uh, radical visibility. So often uh, disabled people are not given the spotlight and they're asked to sort of fit in without making, um, making themselves stand out in any way. And as you can see, Sky's work really does make people stand out, but they also uh, approach their work in a very personal way. And so the clothes that Sky makes for people are tailored specifically to them, uh, not only physically, but also in um, the way that they desire to be seen by others. We also have two um, ASL uh, masks on the wall with a clear front so that um, 
in, interpreters can be seen lip reading, uh, for, it's for lip readers. So we also have this incredibly powerful logo designed by Jennifer White Johnson um, during the protests that happened when George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were killed. And um, included in the symbol is the power fist silhouette, but also the infinity symbol, which represents the autism community. And I think Jennifer's work is really powerful because she explores the double whammy that people of color with disabilities face um, in terms of discrimination and exclusion. And often young black disabled children in the education system are discriminated against and excluded to a greater degree than, um, than other children. So she has this uh, symbol available for download for free on her website and it was used in many protests um, to represent the disability community too. When you uh, come in through the main entrance of the gallery, you will be able to look at this huge portrait, a huge self-portrait by Anthony Tuzler from I think 1977, when he was really beginning to um, take on a disability identity because he had met other young disabled people who were cool and had begun to realize that he, he could explore this in, in more ways and, and also with his photography. So we see him with cut off jeans so we can see his leg braces. He's sitting in a wheelchair. He's leaning forwards with a slightly raised shoulder. He's got a beer in his hand and he's kind of asking us to stare at him. Um, but he's also slightly sneering at us too. So it's that kind of look of a young person who is saying, you know, this is me, take it or leave it. Um, and so it's not often that we see disabled people in this way. Um, he's not apologizing, he's not explaining, he's just saying, this is who I am. And so I'm really glad that we have this as an enlargement in the show because it's a striking thing as you come into the gallery. And it is um, something that you can spend a lot of time with. There is actually a bench opposite so you can sit and, and look at the portrait in more detail. Um, he's also wearing cowboy boots, I forgot that. Uh, and he's a kind of bad boy, you know, and again, that's another thing that we don't necess necessarily associate with having a disability. And he, uh, I can point out the person who he'd met that was really significant in his um, growth as a dis disabled person taking on a dis disability identity. And this portrait, sorry, it's not a portrait, this documentary shot here has been used a lot in uh, documentaries and publications because it's a kind of iconic shot of the 504 demonstration and takeover of the federal building in 1977 when over 100 people with disabilities um, were organizing and protesting to get the first civil rights legislation for disabled people signed into law. And um, they took over the federal building for almost a month and it's a very San Francisco story because all the local organizations, including the Black Panthers and all the churches and the, the gay men's butterfly brigade, um, everybody who was a nonprofit or could help in any way uh, did what they could to keep the protesters in the building um, because they, they didn't want to dilute the regulations in any way. And there was talk of um, separate but equal education. And they knew that if they gave in, that it was a very slippery slope and things would just get more and more diluted. So uh, to today's uh, people with disabilities owe the campaigners and the protesters from 1977 a huge amount. And the person in the middle of this black and white photograph is Steve Diaz, who um, Anthony had met and they realized that they were both cool and that they could become um, active um, members of society and that their disability didn't have to get in the way. 
the crowd is really diverse in the photograph. There are wheelchair riders, there are uh, lots of people of different races, different ages, and different backgrounds, and they're, you, they're shot from a low perspective. So that's another thing about Anthony's work is that he's a wheelchair user, and so the way he takes photographs is from a much lower down perspective than you would normally, that you would normally get. Um, but this is so great because it has the San Francisco um, main Capitol building in the background. In this uh, smaller gallery, we have uh, an installation, a kind of an experimental installation by a blind artist called Jennifer Justice called Future Maps. And it's a kind of, um, not a recreation of her studio, but it's a, it's a kind of work in progress. So it's very playful and there are sort of a few jokey pieces in here. There's a, a painting called The Carrot and Stick. There's a banana peel hanging from a flagpole. Um, there's a painting of a meteorite and uh, some drawings from her sketchbook. But it's really about um, the kind of cha chaos that we're all surrounded by on a daily basis, it seems, with the pandemic and the climate crisis and the sort of political polarization of everything. And um, as some of the other artists have created work as a response to what's going on, Jennifer is exploring some of the environmental um, issues that we face, but in a kind of playful, sort of slightly panicked way. Um, this piece over here that's hanging in the corner is called um, Bucket of Rain, and it was made um, as a response to a fire in Napa. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what year, but as a blind artist, Jennifer also is a wood turner, so these uh, beautiful wooden shapes hanging down in the shape of different kinds of teardrops. They're, they're different sizes, different woods, um, and they hang down at different levels from beaded chain from a circular um, metal kind of rusty uh, circle that hangs from the ceiling. Um, I think Bucket of Rain says, says a lot, but this piece has quite a history because it also survived um, a fire that happened at the Enchanted Hills Camp, which is, um, I think it's run by the Lighthouse for the Blind every summer, and uh, it survived a fire that got very, very close. So in a way that's also embedded in this piece, this whole, uh, experience that in California we have every year of the fires and the smoke and the, and the environmental problems. And just next to that is um, a tactile map. And Jennifer created this using data provided by the Yurok tribe in, a, in an open source project. So there's a, a big plan to remove four dams in California on the Klamath River, and I think one in Oregon too. And um, it will have a huge impact on the riverways up there and the, the wildlife and the whole ecological health of the river system. Um, I think Jennifer's planning to make more of these tactile maps, but again, it's a, it's a way of exploring this information in a way that maybe is uh, soothing and, and more tactile than just the, the dead information. Um, I'll give you a quick glimpse at the uh, carrot and stick painting, which again is a, is a sort of humorous response to the confusion and chaos we're all experiencing and, and, and the fact that maybe we're not doing enough to respond to the environmental problems that we have, um, which I think is a very common experience because people don't know what to do. And then on the, uh, here we have a vitrine which has some more of Jennifer's wood turned pieces. So this is a place setting. There are two goblets, a, a, a bottle opener and a spoon and a lovely little plate. And on the plate is a 3D printed footprint from a chicken and then going up the wall in really bright blue and green are footprints from 
a pig, a cow, and a rhinoceros. So there's a kind of reference to factory farming, but it's kind of playful because the rhinoceros doesn't really belong there. Um, but I love that kind of joyful exploration of ideas that is going on in here. Um, and there will be a soundtrack played, uh, which is a recording of birdsong from Ukiah, where Jennifer lives, and uh, other sounds, including sounds from these 3D um, footprints when they were in a previous installation that, where they were part of a vibrating um, installation. So, um, but then here we have a kind of fantastic um, banana skin hanging from the wall as another playful element in here. So I think this whole room invites you to let go of the usual way of responding to what's going on. And maybe Jennifer's providing some signposts of how to cope with the situation that we all find ourselves in. So we, we also have a, a comfortable space for you to sit and listen to an audio comic written by Chad Allen, who's a blind writer um, and a blind magician. And he wrote this story as a response to all the chaos and um, confusion going on in the world, but also because of the way that he was feeling isolated as a disabled person and not included. So I'm gonna read something that Chad wrote. Um, so he says, you don't see art with your eyes. You don't see anything with your eyes. All your eyes do is filter light. You see with your brain, and that's what I'm trying to teach people more than anything. So the comic is set in the future, and it's called Unseen. And it's the story of Afsana, who is a blind female assassin, um, also living in a chaotic world in which she feels invisible to society. But also, Chad says, Discounting Afsana's abilities is her enemy's gravest regret. So early in the narrative, we begin to understand that Chad is reframing the narrative um, so that our perceptions of blind and visually impaired people are really challenged. And Afsana is actually an assassin. So it's the first episode of this really exciting story. And I think um, if you listen to it, you'll um, have a completely different perspective on what blind people are all about. This is one of my uh, favorite parts of the exhibition. It's a display case full of disability action figures that have been collected by Anthony Tuzler over the years. Um, it has characters like a pirate. We have African-American uh, wheelchair Barbie. Uh, there's uh, three versions of Dr. X. Uh, I actually don't know the names of all the characters, but there's a whole variety of people with different disabilities from different backgrounds. And I think it's a splendid kind of disability pride display. And on either side, we have prints by Shana Harper, who's an artist at NIAD. Uh, the one on the left says, being normal is overrated. And my kind of favorite piece, in a way, is the one on the right, which says, being an artist is the best feeling in the world. And I'm sure any of you who are artists would agree with that. So I think it's a really nice way to uh, finish the show with the, these kind of interesting comments and statements and this splendid disability pride display. So we've uh, given you a pretty whirlwind tour of what's in the show. I am really happy that the exhibition will be up until the middle of December because it means that people will be able to come back more than once to engage with the work and spend time here. Uh, we're really proud of uh, the access features that we have. So if you want to check out the work online, you can too. You can attend the events online as well as in person. We have a, a huge community day coming up on October the 10th. So I really hope that you can make it to that. Um, but thank you very much for listening to all of this. And I really hope that you enjoy the show. Thank you.